The talk is, uh, uh, I have Twittered the talk Dropbox website, okay, with our hashtag Agile EE, okay? So you could pick it up now on your iPhone in principle. It's also at guild.com under downloads, resources, slides, if you want it now. Otherwise, you have it later. The slides are quite detailed, so uh, you're not going to be able to read them all or study them all. They are intended for maybe reading, studying, sharing afterwards. Don't worry, don't try to read everything. Um, many people tell me, Tom, you have far too much detail in your slides. And I said, that is intentional, because I have a message. Our systems are complex, and my experience is real. No nice color slides with one word, some nice general principle, okay? That's the message, okay? Um, so, uh, uh, there are a lot of links here to uh, uh, the slides themselves and uh, some papers and things like that. Okay, now my main message is uh, pretty simple. I think I announced it this morning. I think we need a paradigm shift from we build code to we deliver value to stakeholders even if we do not write any code. Did you hear me? Yeah. Now, many of the speakers have touched on this subject. Yeah. We're beginning to move in the direction of thinking uh, we should maybe focus on the system for the people and not the code for the computer. Okay, so we're all, we are moving in that direction, but I'd, I'd like a real sharp move. I'd like to, I would like you all to one day believe, as I do, that every project should start and in the first day should define the top 10 most critical stakeholder values, the top 10 things the project wants to achieve, the top 10 things they, that we really must make better, whatever those top 10 are. And those top 10 should be quantified, the qualities there, most of them are qualities, things like uh, uh, there could be efficiency and productivity of staff at a higher level. They could be qualities like security and user friendliness at a, a more technical level, right? But those, all qualities quantified. No, it should be very user friendly, but a number like everybody will learn to use this uh, app in five seconds. You know? It's almost as simple, but it's a lot clearer, isn't it? Everybody should learn to use the app in five seconds, okay? So, we need, uh, so we, need not, we need, first we need to have purpose, which is high level, which is values. That's the whole point of all of our work. No point in writing code if we don't give people value. End of discussion. Our, all our work must be tied into what are you doing for the other people that are going to somehow be impacted by your system. Not, did you write good code? Do you have low technical debt? Do you have few bugs? These are low-level technical questions, okay? Especially, now, if there were a pure programming conference, we can discuss those things, but this is an agile conference, and the whole point with agile was to give better results more early than big to users and customers and other stakeholders, I hope, than big bang projects which focus on the technical stuff and really actually fail time and time again because the big bang projects uh, do not focus on the value, neither at the beginning, nor during the project, nor at the end, okay? So in other words, true agile would be, f would be f focused on delivering great value very early, very incrementally, very continuously from, in my book, the second week of the project. One week to plan it, time box. That's not too much bureaucracy, is it? I'll give you some more detail on it. That's what, how I do all projects, no matter what the size. This whole problem of scaling that's been talked about, okay? I, I believe what we're doing is we're, we're nothing very much better than scrum of scrums. In other words, we're doing the wrong thing. We are delivering code rather than delivering value, and now we're gonna do it on even bigger projects, deliver code rather than value, okay? Let's scale up the right thing, <laughs> okay? Let's scale up the delivery of value, not the delivery of code. Nothing wrong with delivering code, but it's not always necessary. You were, sometimes these 
techies of the world remind me of the little boy with the hammer who thinks everything's a nail. I can code, therefore a solution to everything is coding. It's ridiculous. Okay, we've got to grow out of it, grow up. But it, maybe the agile community can grow up before, say, the Java community. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, that's the main message. Uh, I just got a copy of a, a book about value stream. And I've just started reading it, but I like it. Recommend it. It's hard is in the right place. It's saying those very same things. Time we stop messing about with religions, dogmas, and coding. And time we started delivering value. Okay? It's a very interesting book about agile and very critical of mafia rackets like Scrum. You think I'm joking? Biggest. The mafia has moved away from drugs, prostitution, money laundering over to IT. I'm not joking. This is not a joke. Yeah? They're called Accenture in that gang. Yeah? Anybody like to take a look at the book? Just uh, pass it around. Do give it back. Okay? Very interesting. Very deeply researched. Very broad. Very mature. Okay? Like it all. But I'm only at uh, chapter three, so I'll write a book review when I'm, I'm done. Anyway, but I, I did like uh, illustration uh, 1.2 in the book. Because, uh, it, see that little picture of me down there? That wasn't in the book, I just added it to make it visually easier. And I apologize for the quality of the uh, uh, illustration here. But uh, basically, it, it, it says that uh, uh, you can trace my early work from 70s and 80s up to through the Agile Manifesto and beyond. So that's uh, one of, and I just got a new email today, another guy, uh, Peter, Meezy wrote a book about Agile. I just got a copy, and it, it uh, does the same thing. Places me as the grandfather, maybe great-grandfather, okay, <laughs> of Agile. That's one. So C Craig may be old, but I think I'm even older. <laughs> okay. So, uh, oh, uh, there's my, uh, by the way, there was a, we had a great talk on, on, soft, on metrics today. Uh, 1976, I coined the term and published the book Software Metrics. Grandfather of that, too. You start early enough, you become a grandfather of a little bit of everything. Okay? Yeah. Uh, th that's the name of the book, Mark Kennelly, Value Stream, at the bottom, if somebody wants to pick that up uh, easily. Okay. Um, I, I got an assignment from a, a, a bank in Scotland. They shall remain anonymous. But the, 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 the IT guys, of course, had decided to go agile. And, but they needed management's permission and encouragement and even said, you know, Agile isn't just for IT, it's for the whole bank. And so everybody in IT was saying, well, the bank manager is going to announce what we're going to do, but we don't know what it is. So the bank managers called me and my son Kai in and said, uh, everybody's expecting us to tell, tell them what Agile is, but we haven't got a clue. Would you please inform us? So we spent about a half a day. And this, is, uh, this slide is actually part of our presentation of management. But I took the trouble to rethink what is Agile really? Is it Scrum? Is it XP? Is it stand-up meetings? Is it having two-day courses and becoming master of the universe? Huh? Or is it absolutely anything that in fact permits you to deliver value in spite of uncertainties and turbulence? Yes. That's a good definition. So here's my definition of value. So this allows anything. If it works, meaning delivers value, in spite of change and uncertainty, then it's agile. End of discussion. And if it's on a training course called agile, but it does not deliver value, it does not focus on value, that's a pretty good definition of Scrum, <laughs> then it is not agile. So let me just start. Scrum is not agile. Just out of curiosity, how many people knew that before I mentioned it? I have some hands going up, okay? I'll get the rest of you warmed up and we'll see. I'm going to lay out a convincing case. I've even got Jeff Sutherland agreeing with me. You'll see documented. <laughs> okay? Scrum is not, is not focused on delivering value, and it should be. Okay? So, but changing Agile, that's something, sorry, changing Scrum is a, 
different bureaucratic matter. Okay. Uh, here's our agile process. This is the one called EVO, which we were doing in the 70s and 80s. For example, uh, Hewlett Packard did hundreds of projects from 88, no, before 88, but from the early 80s on on, using our agile method known as EVO. Okay? We have two master's theses researching the numbers on how well it did. You can have a copy by request. Okay? That was real agile. So we're, we're going in small cycles, weekly cycles. We're delivering stuff. But there's one difference. They are learning to quantify the value, and they're managing the quantification of value when they deliver. That's the little trick that my agile manifesto friends forgot. Okay? They thought they're supposed to manage code delivery because they were, in their heart, coders. My dear friends like Kent Beck, you know, he, he, he is unabashedly a coder who loves coding. And even if you try to get him to talk about XP, he said, I don't care about that process shit anymore. You know? <laughs> so if these guys were programmers in their heart. Nothing wrong with being a programmer in your heart, but wouldn't it be nice if the programmers in their heart decided to deliver value instead of code? You know, society would be better off. Okay? But they totally uh, forgot to mention value and quantification of value and stakeholders in the entire Agile manifesto. So off we go and we have uh, years of learning to accelerate the velocity of delivering code, even if it doesn't deliver any value. About time we stopped. Okay? Maybe the next Agile EE conference will be retitled Value Delivery Conference. Yes, but now we have to define lean and agree the meaning of that. But yeah, of course it is. No? Yeah. Well, okay. Let's say yes kindly, but then we need to have a lovely little debate about that. So, but uh, that's fine. Uh, uh, now, uh, uh, this is our model. Now, uh, uh, one of the lecturers uh, referred to Dr. W. Edwards Deming and his famous plan, do, study, act, cycle, uh, statistical process control. So this is just a variation of it, but it is our EVO cycle. Okay? Now, uh, it becomes more clear what we're talking about by the next slide, which positions Scrum at the bottom and is basically saying nothing wrong with Scrum, but if you don't give it clear direction, clear ideas of values, make them measurable, then the programmers don't know what to do. So they will churn out code, they get paid for it, but they won't necessarily deliver value if you don't even tell them what the value is, and you just tell them what the code is, what the functions are, what the user stories are. Value is different from a user story. We have this assumption that's been there for over 50 years, uh, if you just put it on a computer, value will automatically happen. Sorry, not true. In case you didn't notice. Okay, so we need, uh, we need to uh, look at stakeholders more clearly. We need to look at stakeholder values. Translate them into something measurable, trackable, testable. Then introduce something, uh, it says solutions here. Actually, that's actually missing as far as I'm concerned from the whole Agile process. It's also known as architecture or design engineering. We need to design so that we get the values. Then maybe some code needs to be written, and maybe we need to test that that code does shorten the time for the nurses to give a prescription. And not that it has the right function and no bugs, but it doesn't shorten the time for the nurses. That's the value idea. Okay? And then we need to uh, measure, not the, a burn-down chart where we're delivering uh, functionality, but we need to measure a burn-down chart where we're delivering value. And when the value we want is delivered, that's the definition of done. Done is when you've delivered the value they expect for their money and you've promised to give them. It doesn't matter. It, it, done is if you delivered all the value, but you've actually written no code whatsoever, you are done. Definition of done. We argue about it all the time, but when does value enter into the argument? It's all about code. This is silly. Immature. Okay? Let's grow up. And learn. But not just learn things like how we could code faster. What about learn how we could deliver more value faster? 
different kind of learning, a different kind of retrospective. Did we deliver value? Is there any way we could have delivered it faster? What's standing in our way? Those should be the questions that are retrospective. So we've got a framework, but we're using it for code, not value. You need to be explicit about value. It's not implicit. Writing code does not automatically bring value. In the presentation to the bank, I put in some slides from one of my favorite authorities on Agile, David Rico, name bottom there. Uh, he shows how scary rich Agile can be when all the disciplines and all the problems are there. He's got his own website. He's got his own books. How many people have ever encountered David Rico's work? Just get some idea. Uh, ben? Nobody else. Gee. Well, now you've encountered it. The answer was yes, just now, Tom. Okay. Uh, he's written a lot of pa uh, On my website, you'll find uh, I've, I've hosted some of his uh, slides, which you can have free in papers. He's very good, very deep about Agile. He looks at things like the return on investment from Scrum, XP, compared to all other methods. What is the return on investment from Scrum? Hmm. Rico's studied it, published it, figured it out. We just do it because it's the right religion. That's like saying, what's the return on Christianity as opposed to uh, Judaism? <laughs> okay, we, we have a religion here, let's admit it. Uh, all the years I've been observing this scene, from 1958 to be precise, when I joined IBM, I've seen a religious community adopting a series of new religions that don't work, and then the solution is always, well, we must find a new religion. <laughs> yeah? The idea is we've got to find something that works. Uh, no, not clearly there. So uh, I, I used this to scare the bank directors. I said, do you realize, you know, somebody maybe sold this idea that Agile is terribly simple. You know, only three things, to, uh, three things of this and three things of that. It's like uh, Agile community is so stupid they can't count beyond three. Everything's simplified. That's a great way to sell something, but it doesn't necessarily make it effective. Okay, Father, the Holy Ghost, yeah, there's... Some religions that have trinities too, right? <laughs> so I point out to the bank managers that if they were to do all this stuff and do it well, it would take all of their energy for the next 10 years to get half good at it. Were they prepared for that? I think they were sold the idea that they just sort of say, yeah, let's do agile and away we go. You take a look at that list of things and think about doing them very professionally, very well, it's a lot of management work to get the troops to do these things well. So I wanted to sort of scare them into understanding that if they were going to do this, it was non-trivial. And I told them, I don't think you're ready to do this. Okay? Forget it. Okay? Here's some more uh, Rico uh, stuff. Uh, again, he's, he's wonderfully systematic in analyzing Agile. So I'm not going to go through it in detail, but it, it does give us, if you like, frameworks for understanding Agile, for exploring it. Let's just leave it at that, okay? You might well invite Rico to your next conference. He's very good. Uh, here, again, just to scare the bank directors, 14 things that could go really wrong when you use agile methods. You probably all have some experience of these things, I expect. You know, in other words, it isn't like, you, it's very simple, you just do it, oh, the, the world will be saved. It's, there are a hell of a lot of problems here, okay? But, of course, the guys selling the methods talk too little about those problems. Although somebody like Jess Sutherland will say, well, the reason why 19% uh, uh, you know, uh, of all projects using Scrum fail is they're not doing Scrum properly. But that's just a reflection of the problem. I was amazed in Warsaw, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Agile Warsaw a few years ago. Jess Sutherland held a talk. And he said, you know, my, the, the other guys, meaning uh, Big Bang and everybody else, they have total IT project failure rate of about 40%. Some say 50, some say 60, and up over, right? Scrum only fails 19% of the time. Total failure. Okay. Now, imagine I'm a heart surgeon, and you need a new heart, right? So you come to me and say, can I trust you? You know, I mean, it's kind of scary getting cut open having your heart replaced. Oh, you can trust me. I'm much better than the other surgeons. The other guys kill two out of five patients on the operating table, and they maim the other, you know, make them handicapped. Me, I only kill one out of five and maim the other four. This is, uh, maim means uh, uh, not totally failed IT projects, but not very satisfactory. 
And the good news is, I've just treated four patients in a row, and they all, none of them died on the operating table, and you're number five. <laughs> you want to? This is what we're offering the world. This is the best Scrum can do, is kill one out of five patients on the operating That means before they even get off the operating table, they are dead, before they're ever delivered. You know what I think? I think our ambition level should be clear. Zero failure. Failure is not an option. And you know what? We actually, as a software community, know how to accomplish that every time. But of course, you don't know. How many people know how to have success on a project every time. They know a method for it. It isn't, it isn't called Scrum, I can tell you that. It's this. Yes, <laughs> one of my students. <laughs> okay. In, uh, I've got some slides on it coming up, but Harlan Mills, who I call the Leonardo da Vinci of software engineering, was given a project by IBM Federal Systems Division, meaning the toughest software project, space, military in 1970, okay? And the problem IBM had was every time they won a low-cost bid, they lost money. Some of you are maybe in the business and experience similar things. You bid too low, so you get the job, but you lose money. And IBM said, we like to earn money, so this is not a good idea. Hardland, can you fix it so we never lose money on a software project? They're outsourcers, okay? And he did. It's called the clean room method. Now, how many people here have heard of the clean room method at all? Okay, a few more. You can look it up. You can Google it. There are books on it. There's stuff on the web. Okay? Ten years later, he reported from specific projects, like from Space Shuttle and from uh, 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 missile projects and things like that, uh, uh, sorry, submarine projects, that the software projects were delivered almost always on time and under budget, meaning they earned a profit, to the highest quality specifications of NASA and Department of Defense. These are not fools, right? For six years, almost all the time, for the last four years, absolutely every time. In other words, zero defect in project delivery, the most difficult projects, was accomplished by the end of 1980. How many people were born after 1980 here? Oh, well, you wouldn't remember now, would you? <laughs> it was actually published in the IBM System Journal, number 4, 1980. There are links on the web to it. If you can't find them, I'll help you. Okay? And that's amazing. So it, it, since, since the 70s, we have known and practiced industrially on a large scale how a form of agile, it's an early uh, form of agile, okay, uh, that always seems to deliver the most complex software projects on time, under budget, to the highest quality levels every time for a year on end. Scrum doesn't do that. Jeff Sutherland said, you know, 19% fail and that's good. We sh if we know how to do it, why don't we do it? Scrum is not the answer. I'm not even saying clean room is the answer, but uh, we can start exploring there. It is an agile technique. For example, uh, one project called the LAMPS project, it's on a ship helicopter thing, they had a, a four-year project, but they delivered incremental value every month for four years, 48 increments, 2% increments. They even, my slides back it up in detail, a guy called Quinnen, used every slide to measure the architecture or design, whether it was delivering the qualities that they required, like the high availability. And if they didn't deliver, they changed the design or architecture. They were actually dynamically testing and measuring the architecture with regard to the values of their client, whatever they were, in 1970s. That is way in advance of Scrum or AP. Why aren't we doing it? It's out there. Did our universities fail to train us in methods that worked? Yes. <laughs> Did the professors know about this? Probably not. Did their professors fail to train them? Probably yes. I even discovered that uh, people at IBM didn't know about this if they weren't in IBM Federal Systems Division. So not strange that 
a, a professor 20 years ago in, in Ukraine or wherever you're from uh, didn't know about it. But it was published in IBM Systems Journal, a very high, and it was published again because it was so sensational about 1989 as one of the great wonders of the world. Okay, so it wasn't exactly a deep secret. But it, of course, we didn't have internet then. And maybe memes like this didn't spread so well. But it's on the internet now. I have the links to it. OK. So in, in simple terms, what I'm trying to do is say we, we need uh, somebody or something to decide to manage the value. And in fact, in simple terms, obviously, if we're going to keep product owners, that's the job of the product owner. However, right now, they're not charged with the responsibility and they're not trained to do it, so they can't, okay? But that would be the logical place to do it, okay? Here are the methods we use, symbolically, very quickly. We'll see more of it. it uh, I'll, I'll, uh, on my course tomorrow, I'll spend a half a day just explaining what the hell is going on here, okay? But at the top level, we have corporate goals, symbolic, uh, profit share, market share, resources. And then we have some strategies which we think will give these to us, okay? And we have some numbers indicating how strong the strategies are. This is a simple estimate of how good are the architectures or strategies for our goals. Look at the second level, the stakeholder level, where those strategies become goals into themselves. And there uh, we think that intuitiveness and performance uh, 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 tactics will give us good results. So go to the third level, the product, that's a, sorry, the stakeholder level. This is the nurses and doctors level. The top level is CEO, CTO, board of directors. Third level, product values. This is the quantification of quality in the, say, the software itself. This is the user friendliness and security of the software itself, okay? With some design, symbolically GUI uh, and, and code optimization, with some numbers indicating how powerful it is. Once we've picked these uh, strategies, we put them on the uh, backlog and say to the programmers, please program this strategy. We believe it will give us intuitiveness and performance at low resource. And we believe that will give us the shareholder, uh, stakeholder values. And we believe that will give us the corporate values. This is a uh, multiple level. In other words, we're looking at the whole organization. Many people from this podium today have talked about whole organization, whole thinking. Here is a practical tool for doing it. I didn't hear any practical tools for doing it when I listened today, okay? This allows you to model at any level of any organization the uh, requirements at that level and the strategies or architectures at that level and connect them all. We do this on our projects regularly, okay? I'll be teaching it tomorrow afternoon, as a matter of fact, okay? Uh, if you can't come, don't worry, go to my website, read the things here, you can figure it out yourself. <laughs> okay, you don't have to use time on it. It's called impact uh, estimation, or in this case, we're, we're calling it a value decision table. Uh, there's Jeff Sutherland being suitably impressed by this, in case you wondered if your uh, you know, religious leaders in Scrum approve. <laughs> okay, I mean, you wouldn't dare take a step without their formal approval, would you? I mean, don't be creative, don't be innovative, just follow the religion or you'll burn in hell. Well, you'll have your scrum master revoked. This was uh, developed by my son, Kai, who's windsurfing in Hawaii right now for three weeks. Talk about life-work balance. <laughs> Last year, he took his whole family to Hawaii for a 10-month vacation and went windsurfing every bloody day. He planned doing it with our methods, and then he's been doing it for years. Wouldn't you like to go to Hawaii with your family for 10 months instead of sitting around here? No? Yeah. Okay. There's a picture of uh, Jeff. That just happens to be at my summer cabin on the Oslo Fjord, which is heaven on earth with a beautiful piece of water. Uh, nice place to live. So... Um, uh, we were just having a, a discussion after my class on Wednesday about the uh, quality of life index the United Nations publishes every year. So you can Google quality of life and put in Ukraine. And uh, it's, well, maybe if you, if you don't want to feel bad today, you shouldn't do that because Ukraine is listed as number 100. Norway, five years in a row, number one. Sometimes, on, uh, some years, beaten by Switzerland and Sweden. Hmm. So 
So I wasn't born in Norway. I was born in the USA. Don't bother. It's dying. Started dying about 60 years ago. Corrupt, stupid. You know, you're, you're actually better off here, I think. But uh, I chose where to go to live a good life, and I'm living it. It's called Norway. It, uh, in addition to everything, they even have this oil money, which means they'll be able to pay my medical bills and my children's higher education and my pension as long as I'm alive. So, you know, unlike Spain or Greece or Lord knows what's happening here. Okay. I, I can't quite hear it, so for timing reasons, we'll take it afterwards, okay? I'm going to the, you're going to the banquet tonight? We'll have a discussion. Uh, I, uh, I'm a very strong believer that it's very important to understand fundamental principles. For example, in simple terms, you can't deliver value if you don't even articulate what that value is. <laughs> This is one message I like to get along. And people are not articulating so they can't deliver it, and yet that's the main point. Okay? So I'm kind of, I have uh, hundreds and hundreds of principles here and there and all my books and papers. So here I just thought, uh, take my, my key agile principles. By the way, I originally wrote these in 2003 and started holding talks in 2003 at agile conferences in Britain called What's Wrong with Agile? Where it took about 10 years, a few more voices are chiming in, like Mark Kendley in that book I showed you, okay? But it's perfectly obvious to me from the very start that yes, they got the iterative feedback bit, hurrah! But they totally forgot the value bit. Uh, the talk will illustrate and give more detail on these, but if you like the condensed one-page version of my talk, it's right there. There is a paper on this too, which is listed, the link is on the first page. Okay. So, again, summary of all those principles is whatever you do technically, make sure it feeds into stakeholder value measurably, early. <laughs> End of discussion. That's it. Goodbye. We can all go to the banquet. And that was it. Okay, I have a few more slides. I, I like it when Craig opened and said, I'm just going to talk a little bit. We're going to have 45 minutes of questions. I, I, I guess he was joking, right? So, yeah. I'm just joking. I, I want to show the other slides to you. Okay. So, um, first principle, already talked about a bit. I believe that for every project, little or gigantic, you can, in one day, get a group of responsible people, the people paying for it, maybe, to decide on the top 10 things they'd like to improve. Just make a decision. They, they might have 50 things they'd like to improve. You draw a line and say, can we, at the end of the day, say these 10 are the most important? When they're done, we'll look at the other ones. But we're not going to look at 5,000 things simultaneously that leads directly to waterfall model and Big Bang. This is agile. So agile means you take little slices and start working on them. Agile means you focus. You don't get your focus diversified to 5,000 things for three years of analysis, okay? That's the old sickness. And, uh, and uh, I call these the critical few. Whether a few is 10 or 5 or even 11, I don't care. But the moment you start getting 100 more, I worry that we are uh, losing focus on the essentials, okay? Uh, critical few. And it says quantified. I believe that absolutely all improvements and almost everything is about improvements. I've never seen an IT project that wasn't all about improvements. Needs to be quantified, because only if it's quantified can we understand what it is, aim for it as architects or designers, and test and track and measure that we're getting it or not. And put it in contracts, by the way. What about contracting by value rather than hours of work or code written? There's some exciting stuff done. There's a website called, uh, let's see, uh, uh, Simplified Contracts, I think it is off the top of my head. But it's a couple of uh, friends of mine, including a Scrum teacher, Gabriel Benefield, Gabriel, Gabriel Benefield who, uh, uh, under my guidance for two years, developed a way of contracting for Agile for value. Okay, be pleased to uh, uh, hook you into it. 
uh, fairly ingenious. In, in other words, no upfront price, but in fact, you contract by value every cycle. Okay? Or you have a framework contract that allows you to essentially rewrite the contract as you go along. That's very sexy. That's where we ought to be. In other words, if a customer is not getting value, they shouldn't pay. If they are getting value, they should pay, and this should be in the contract. And yes, it's very difficult to know all the details ahead, so we don't even try, because this is agile. We figure them out as we go along. Literally, every cycle, there's a little subcontract saying, what value will we deliver this week? And how much do you think it'll cost? Is this yes, go. Ingeniously simple, perfect for agile. Here's a real example from one of my illustrious clients of the requirements for a project that, when I met the project manager, had been going eight years. It was relocated from Texas to China. I met the 90 Chinese in the Chinese army, I guess, on the project. And uh, the, the project manager, who was the sixth project manager, the others had been fired, because no, nothing of any value whatsoever, these are the values, have been delivered for eight years. Oh, by the way, some people say they spent $100 million on the project up to that point, delivering nothing. That's called value for money. No, sorry, no value for money. Some people said it cost $160 million. But who cares? $60 million between friends. After all, we're just wasting money anyway, so we waste another $100 million. They would have done that. This is Big Bang at its worst. There was no form of uh, agile delivery at all. But Worse than that, there was no form of clarity. The, it, these things here were the things that the chief executive officer approved as the reason for funding the project. And what have you got? Management bullshit at its worst. Not one clear, unambiguous, testable, measurable idea of the law. It was buried in the desk of the project manager. None of the 90 people on the project had any idea of what this project was supposed to do, but they were busy writing code and getting paid for it at a rate of approximately $20 million a year. Isn't that ridiculous? I mean, you wouldn't want your money to be used that way, but you don't mind getting paid from other people's money for doing it, do you? Got to live. Uh-huh. Uh, we probably show some examples later, depending on our timing, but uh, uh, we, we found that we could quantify all of those same day if we tried. We took robustness, divided into eight different things, one of which was testability, and we quantified these things with scales of measure and goals. Okay, but that's not the next slide. Okay. Here's another example. Uh, this is about 1,000 people in uh, London building telecoms products. And uh, the, the CEO decided that they needed to manage their business a little bit better. And uh, uh, in one day, these top 10 objectives for the 1,000 software people were written down and quantified. Let's give you a real example. Okay. Here's another example. Uh, we've got some more detail on it if we have time. This is from the US Department of Defense. This is a project for Persinscom, which is the U.S. Army personnel system. So it's big. Uh, it totally failed in the first Gulf War to perform. It was considered the, uh, the totally useless by General Schwarzkopf, who led the successful war otherwise. And so we had to, uh, in a sense, we had an, uh, uh, a legacy system about eight years old. And uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't performing uh, as it should in war. And so we gave ourselves one day, and we did about 10 of these, and we quantified the top 10 goals. We started delivering some of the goals in the first week. That's a long story short, okay? But this whole idea of each next week and every week delivering some of these goals was considered absolutely crazy. It was not gonna happen at the Pentagon. But, uh, but this is agile at its best that says, I don't care how big and bureaucratic you are, Pentagon, we are going to deliver real results every week. Actually, the joke was, when I said, next week we're going to start delivering, that's the agenda, uh, they said, oh, we can't do that, you know, everything takes 10 years and this is the Pentagon. And I said, you know, that's funny, General Schwarzkopf successfully prosecuted a war and 
chased Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait, which is a military object, in three days. And you IT people can't even make a small improvement in a little IT system in several years. You think I'm crazy, I think you're a little bit out of date. When I was a kid, we had nice, long wars, about seven years, remember? There were Russians and Germans overrunning Ukraine and all that kind of stuff, okay? We have to uh, get in tune with the rest of the world here, which is moving at a slightly faster pace. Principle two, make sure those results and values are business results, not technical results. In other words, I don't care how many bugs you have, but I do care that the business is increasing its profitability or sales. I could even be more general here. They should be stakeholder results, some of which are not business. But you might have a stakeholder like Ukrainian law saying what you can do with the database. Okay? and you have to beef up the security because of the law. That doesn't really help you in business, but it does help you be with inside, inside the law. And it's a stakeholder quality need for the extra security. Uh, we had uh, uh, people from Ericsson talking today. Here's a project we did in Ericsson. Uh, their problem, in a nutshell, was that they had about 3,000 engineers building base stations. Uh, sorry, the software the logic for the base station. They had probably another 3,000 building the hardware. And uh, this was in the 90s when uh, you could sell as many as you could make and get very rich. And they, they, they tried to hire about 7,000 new people, but there was nobody left to hire they wanted to pay for. They'd reached the bottom of the barrel. And they didn't know what to do. And I said, what about increasing the productivity of the 3,000 engineers you have? And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, I happen to know that they're wasting two-thirds of their time doing stupid stuff anyway, so if we can lean, get rid of the muda and the waste, that would triple their productivity, wouldn't it? And they said, well, that sounds like an interesting idea. We got nothing else, so we, we studied it. We started off by defining the top level. This is the, these are the names of the top level objectives for a very large software organization, 3,000. Right? These are the things they wanted to improve. You can probably guess what they are, but they're all quantified. Okay, this is published in my slides. So uh, maybe there's some more detail. Maybe not in this particular set, but I can we can give you the the detail. But that uh, after uh, it took us actually two weeks to negotiate the meaning of software productivity for Ericsson at that point, and this is the framework. Okay, and they're all quantified. Uh, we had a number of other things. These are the low-level technical things. In other words, if you do this lot, you support the higher-level ones. You support these, okay? But these are holy. This is, this is live or die for Ericsson on the market. These are just nice technical things to do that will help that. You can see, you got it? These are the two levels I talked about, the corporate level and the technical level, or the stakeholder level and the technical level is probably better. Uh, there, there's actually a link to the details of all of this. Okay. Uh, given timing, I'm going to skip rather rapidly past the next section, but I, um, I had a large Nordic bank that was very interested in product owner, and I, of course, derided product owner concept at his, uh, for, for large projects at his, as it is now thought about. And so to make a long story short, I ended up writing a paper suggesting how the new product owner should look for large projects. Okay. And so that's what this is about. I think we uh, basically, one, you have to, for large projects like large skyscrapers or large hotel buildings, you can't just have carpenters and plumbers, i.e. coders, no matter how good they are, no matter how fast their velocity of laying the wood is. Okay? You have to have architects and engineers. You have to have an engineering paradigm to put together really, the really complex systems, which are very prevalent in every country, government and private. Okay? So it, we still have a model based on the smart programmer, the Kent Beck. Okay? And we need a model, an industrial model, which all other trades have gone to sooner or later, building bridges, building buildings, whatever it is, building railways, which is architecture and engineering. Okay, uh, you could say, what did Tom say? Tom said it's time to do serious engineering in software. We've had the term or word software engineering since 1968, 
when the first software engineering conferences were done. But you know why it was called software engineering then? Esker Dijkstra told me. Uh, they used it as a trick to get money from NATO for the conference. That by calling it engineering, they got more money than if they just called it programming. But there was no engineering at the time. So software engineering started off being a, uh, a cheat or co a con trick, actually. <laughs> but I, I spent the rest of my life trying to figure out what the hell it is. And it's largely copying patterns from other forms of engineering. We've got some of them here. You know, how they do it. And they, you know, the idea of quantification of primary qualities of things is normal in engineering and architecture. So there's more, but not a lot of time to talk about it, but I can at least point you to the paper and the ideas. So if anybody says, I'd like to look at a more advanced product owner notion, but uh, you know, if you accept this notion, our projects require this, I don't say all projects require this, then you have to be prepared to assign responsibility and train people accordingly. And it's not a two-day Scrum product owner course. That's for sure. How about four years of education to become a beginner as an engineer? I'm, uh, we have some of our clients where we've uh, delegated tremendous power to the grassroots. Let's call them programmers or developers. And we found they do much smarter things in delivering value much more quickly than any level of management or any level of architecture. I have a separate talk called Power to the Programmers. You'll find it on videos, and you'll find it on my website. But it goes into some detail about the, the delegating power to the grassroots level, call them self-organized teams, to find out the technical stuff they need to do to deliver the numeric value they are charged with. They are the best ones to do it. So I'm not suggesting we go back to big bang models with chief architects and directors more or less deciding what to do. I'm, I'm suggesting we have a, 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 people who at the grassroots are very smart people, often very well educated. They haven't been empowered to engineer their own systems. They haven't even been given the right requirements to begin to engineer their own systems, so they can't. Yeah, so quantifying goals it says, I'm finished with this. We just need to go faster. Now you figure out the technology to do it. And if, if you measure it and it works, it's approved. It does not have to go through an architectural review committee or anything dumb like that. Okay? In other words, we use the, the actual measurement of how architecture and design works in delivering values to decide if it is the right thing or not. This is exactly what Quinn and IBM Federal Systems Division did. I have some quotations in the slides, even if I don't get to them, in 1970s. They let the measurement of the architecture decide what was the right architecture, the wrong architecture. The incremental dynamic architecture, not architecture up front. That stupid big bang. You always get it wrong on large complex systems. When anybody has a, uh, an idea for how to get these values, uh, these ideas are called different names like designs, solutions, strategies, architecture, or means. Right? But they all mean the same thing, stuff we do so we get, reach our goals. Okay? And what I found is people are constantly laying on the table their ideas. We ought to have encryption here and use this structure or method there. But uh, I believe that at the same time anybody lays a technical idea on the table, they ought to be responsible for estimating how much value on our value agenda, the quantified goals, they expect to get. They don't do that today. Just lay the name of the thing on the table and say, do it. This is what architects do. I held a talk, that's sort of a fairly early warning signal. We started late, didn't we? This is five, I've got another 10 minutes, I reckon. <laughs> Try to finish off in that time. But uh, now, so, so uh, here, by the way, is a simple example. This is a small uh, uh, st startup with 16 developers. But they are worldwide, they have 50% of the world market in their product. Okay? It's a small Norwegian company. They're doing that. When they suggest recoding, as a, uh, they estimate that it will, it'll save 20 minutes. They need to get something down from 65 minutes to 25 minutes for delivering marketing reports. That's the user value. Okay? But uh, they actually have a stand-up brainstorming architecture session about a half an hour, lay 12 ideas on the table, but every idea must estimate the value it will contribute at the level of the value of the stakeholders. 
And the one that has the highest estimated value gets to be done by the team. This is a self-organizing team making their own decisions about their own design and trusting one another. Because you know, if some, somebody doesn't know what they're doing, constantly screws up, suggests something, nobody's going to buy into that and waste their time. But if a person who regularly has good ideas, the ideas pan out, suggests we can save the most or uh, get the most value with my idea, then the team's going, let's go for it. They also estimate the time it'll take them. I don't have time to go through this in detail, but this is a lovely little example. But this is exactly what the clean room method did on a much larger scale in the 1970s. Quinnen is the reference there. Okay. Uh, this is not graphically good enough. I sweated for about 10 minutes trying to get better graphics here. Forget it. So I think we'll relax. <laughs> but uh, th this is actually, I'll, I'll tell you what's happening here, even though you probably can't read the numbers. Uh, I showed you earlier for this 1,000 software engineers in London the uh, uh, objectives. Okay, that's on the left-hand side, the business objectives. The stuff at the top, that is corporate architecture for software engineers, for 1,000 software engineers, to make them better, to make them more productive. The numbers below are estimates of how much value will be delivered by those things here. Okay? This was done in one day, first rough estimate. It was used the next day to beg for money. Mr. Moneybags, from the big corporation in the sky, came along to, uh, and, and the CEO wanted to get 50 million pounds. Now, everybody wants 50 million pounds, right? You? Yeah. Uh -huh. So it, it, just, just say, standing there in front of a rich guy, in front of uh, Bill Gates or Warren Buffett, please give me 50 billion dollars, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. So you've got to have a good reason. Now, if you could convince Bill Gates you could eradicate disease in the whole of uh, Africa, you could get 50 billion pounds. We've used this method to get 1 million pounds for startups in London from Bill and Melinda Gates. Okay, that's called the Lou Watt. Look up LouWatt.com. you find that project. Use these methods. You've got a million. But I think it's even more fun with 50 million pounds, right? So the guy with Mr. Moneybags came and saw this plan for spending the money and simply wrote a check for 50 million pounds and went off. It said, most people are just begging for money and don't have good reason. You guys have pointed out exactly what I will get numerically if I give you the money. Here's the money, goodbye. So I just taught you a trick for getting 50 million pounds when you want it. Or maybe just a million. Uh, I know that Ukraine would dearly love to have a lot more foreign investment. <laughs> You have to convince your investors that they're going to get something for the money. And I think you have to put numbers on the table. At least if you do, you compete for the money much better from all the other people in the whole of Europe and the world that would love to have the money of the foundations and European Commission and God knows what. You know? Why don't you make your argument as clearly as possible? Give us the money, the following miracles will happen, the numbers, we're committed, we're responsible. The other guys are just going to say, well, we're going to do some very advanced high-tech architecture for six years and spend $60 million of European money. And that happens all the time, in case you didn't know. Okay? I mean, you know, Europe ain't that rich any longer. Ask the Spaniards and Greece. <laughs> and the Germans are tired of funding it all. So uh, money's tight. You, you've got to be more competitive. Okay? This is actually the impact estimation table for the Persinscom system, where on the left-hand side are the t top 10 objectives that we set on Monday of the first week of the project. This is, we're actually uh, improving uh, a uh, legacy system, eight years old. Okay? We're not going to rebuild the whole damn thing. But we're improving it in the direction of the numbers there. The left-hand number is how bad it is, right-hand number is how good we want it to be. So about uh, 10 measurable things. The top level are major architectural strategies that are going to do a lot of business process re-engineering. The numbers uh, down the columns are um, uh, estimates of how much value we will get, value being defined by the left-hand quantified things, if we do these things. Okay? Using the numbers, uh, two things are happening simultaneously here. One, you're actually decomposing the architecture. <laughs> into about 100 little components, most of which can be delivered independently. Okay? So all you have to do is ask a spreadsheet to look for the biggest number and say, why don't we do that next week? What's the biggest number there? 
200, go for it. Can you think of any business process re-engineering that would increase the availability of a software system? I can order some soldiers to stand around waiting to fix the bugs when they hit. <laughs> Next week, can you do that? If you're a general, you can do that. That's, and you've re-engineered the organization of the process. Yeah? Why wait till next week? They did things like that here, for real. Okay, uh, sort of used up my time. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna uh, skip all kinds of nice little things. These are the IBM Federal Systems Division things, clean room I was inspecting. There's Harlem Mills. There's the stuff from Quinnen I mentioned. They're worth studying because this is very sexy, dynamic, quantified design, and it's agile. Okay, this is the first large-scale use of Agile, although Craig Larman did something. Craig, are you here at all or? No? Gone? Okay. Uh, I, I fed this to Craig in 2003 that they'd been doing this. He'd heard rumors and I had the documentation. I worked with these people. And he did something I never did. He traced it back two generations earlier. He said, where did you get these ideas? He said, well, we're building rockets, Tom. This is what rockets do. They home in using process control on targets that keep on changing, like requirements, enemy aircraft. So when we're building software from 1945, this is practically Werner von Braun talking himself, who became the ex-Nazi present American chief rocket scientist. We decided to build software the same way we built rockets, with process control towards variable targets. In other words, what we call iterative, incremental, agile today. Uh, and it, it, Craig traced that right back to the originals. Okay. So this is uh, rocket science, this agile stuff proven historically. And uh, we, we skip through that and uh, all kinds of nice little things, including fantastic results. Um, there's a paper here. If you're, how many people have any interest in technical debt and reducing it? Okay, you love this paper. This is how in practice, a little Norwegian organization engineered the reduction of technical debt by setting quantified objectives for things like testability and, and mean time to repair and things like that. Amazing stuff. Uh, the idea of uh, letting a programmer refactor according to patterns in the code is a stupid, narrow-minded idea. Okay? Engineering things to to enable you to fix and amend systems much faster is much smarter. They devoted one week every month, and they're empowering the programmers to do it, and it's much more fun than coding, I can tell you, to design how to do that, and then they can measure that their technical debt is being reduced, or the ease of transition. So that's pretty sexy, world first. My Norwegian friends figured that out in 2005, 10 years ago far in advance of the Yanks or Americans who haven't even thought the thought, as far as I can determine. Europe leads, if you know where to look. Huh? Don't listen to these Americans. Actually, I, I, I just applied for Norwegian citizenship. I'll have it within the year, so. <laughs> okay, so there's some stuff about that. Uh, and I'm gonna, really, um, I, I think we're all interested in the political, motivational aspects of Scrum and getting implemented. Everybody's talking about it. So I, I just worked with uh, Dominic Maxi Mini in Stuttgart about a month ago, and he handed me this ma magnificent book, which is called The Scrum Culture, but it's very, very deep on all the horribly large number of aspects of motivation in an organization you have to worry about in Scrum. So I thought I'd point that out to you. There's actually a picture of him and some of the uh, ideas, okay? And then, um, okay, so here we're going to uh, have a vote here. Uh, you have, uh, uh, how many of you would prefer to keep doing conventional coding and refactoring even if the results of doing it are not measurable? You just want to code, right? Maybe you didn't understand my question. <laughs> That's kind of stupid. You're going to do it because you're going to do it. You're going to refactor even though there are no measurable results. Things don't get better. You understand my question? Yeah. Okay. Um, how many of you think that you ought to try, I'm not saying you know how to do it, but you could learn, how to engineer measurable software maintainability results, reduce the mean time to repair, for example? Okay. Even if your boss is not smart enough to support you doing it. How many people would sort of like to become an engineer? Yeah. 
Well, there's hope for Ukraine. And, well, maybe it's just Poles over there raising their hands. Ukrainians are, I don't know. <laughs> How many Ukrainians think you ought to engineer large software systems in principle? Okay. How many aren't sure, but they would like to try to learn if it were possible? How many couldn't give a shit? <laughs> Nobody dares raise their hand. Did anybody raise their hand? <laughs> no. Okay. I, of course, if you're in the agile business uh, and you're rewriting manifestos, you not only need principles, but you need values. So here are my values. There's a whole paper on it. Okay. Now, uh, Craig uh, said a style here that I couldn't resist copying. The bad joke at the end. Okay. And uh, he was also discussing, you know, top down, bottom up, and it really has to sort of be both. And it reminded me uh, of a little story. I was in uh, Brazil in about 1990 at a computer conference, and everybody was arguing about whether top down design was right or bottom up design was right and stuff like that. And I got very, very tired of it. So I, I made a slide and put it on the projector. And when that came up, everybody had a good laugh. And people said, this is the only thing that will be remembered 20 years from now from this entire conference. You've got to understand, we're in Brazil, where every man is a playboy, or thinks he is. Here's, here's our latest playboy, Ronaldo. He's going to buy Playboy magazine. Uh, OK, I guess the right-hand image is kind of playboy image, and the left-hand one is the real Ronaldo when he's had a good meal. OK. And uh, so, so the, the, the thing I put on the, it, it is, uh, it, you can answer the question of top down or bottom up if you can answer this question. Does a woman love to be kissed, top down or bottom up? <laughs> you think, if you're unsure, gentlemen, ask her. <laughs> I wouldn't dare do that in America, but I thought I'd pull it off here. Okay. There she is. She's either been kissed top down or bottom up or both. That's the end. There's some stuff here. Uh, in general, you want to learn more about this, go to guild.com, pull it down for free. Okay? Come on our free course tomorrow. Come to some of our free courses in London starting Monday. British Computer Society. Cheap Ryanair ticket, stay up with a friend. Doesn't cost. Pardon? You need a visa. My apologies, but work on it. It's, it's only going to a course. Has anybody here ever been to a course in London? Okay, it can be done, apparently. Okay. Well, that's one reason I'm here. You don't need a visa to hear me here. 10 o'clock tomorrow. Show up. Okay. okay, so thank you very much. See you at the banquet.